Welcome to A History of Confirmation. This is Sharon Ely Pearson, and over the next 30 minutes or so, we will trace the roots and meaning of confirmation over the past centuries. There is much here for us to learn and to apply to what confirmation means in today's 21st century in the Episcopal Church. So let us begin. The conveying of responsibility by the laying on of hands was an ancient practice existing with the Hebrew people. It was a regular and agreed upon method of either transferring or shifting responsibility in the community. This custom predates Exodus and following this laying on of hands or public binding, a participation in a common meal as a, forms of, as a form of communion with the divine ancestor was shared. Much of these Jewish customs found their way into the initiation rites of the early church. During the apostolic age, Christian baptism was complete and adequate entrance into a new relationship with the Father, the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit, becoming a full member of the new church. Households were baptized together, including slaves and children. If children could not answer the questions of renunciation and commitment for themselves, others answered for them. The newly baptized emerged from the water and in many parts of the church were anointed, usually over the entire body. Being marked with the sign of the cross with oil, a part of the rite called consignation, the newly baptized were then reclothed Later in the era, they received white garments. Being brought into the Eucharistic assembly for the first time, they shared the kiss of peace and the people's prayers, made their own offering of bread and wine, and received the body and blood of Christ. Baptism was seen as a water moment of washing from sin and a cleansing act of forgiveness. The anointing, a representation of the rich, flowing life of the Spirit was a sealing of the gift of the Holy Spirit, being marked as Christ's own forever. While the water ritual was the central part of baptism and was seen as an act of initiation, the laying on of hands, the stirring up of the Spirit, had an eschatological quality. In the early church, Converts to Christianity were being made almost exclusively from the ranks of pagans. So a period of preparation for baptism became an important rule, renouncing Satan and confessing the faith of Christ. There was a period of catechesis in which the story of Jesus was Christ was shared, as well as the teachings of the apostles and prayers of the people. This preparation took place over a period of time prior to the celebration of Easter when all new converts were baptized into the church. Following their baptism, the new Christians were welcomed in the household of faith and participated in the community meal, the Eucharist. Justin Martyr was noted as having written that baptism was an illumination, an entrance into a new state of mind. At his time, when the newly baptized were changed what they believed from necessity and ignorance to choice and knowledge. Eucharist immediately followed baptism. Clement of Alexandria in Egypt, at that area and time, initiation was becoming more standardized. Those who participated were called catechumens. Preparation for baptism included preaching about Christ and catechetical formation. Catechumens were expected to repent and to renounce their former behavior. Tartulian of Carthage, also in Northern Africa, felt that baptism was the washing and cleansing and blessing of our bodies so that the imposition of hands could invite the coming of the Holy Spirit. In his writings, he speaks of the spirits resting on the waters of baptism, being active throughout the rite. 
For him, it is not the water, but the seal, which imparts the spirit being given by the bishop. The whole rite remains one service and its minister is the bishop. Oregon, during his time, it was a period of preparation for baptism, including doctrinal and moral formation. Catechumens learned about Christian precepts of faith, including the Trinity, eternal life, human freedom, and the scriptures. Hippolytus of Rome gives us a great deal of understanding and writings regarding the liturgies of the church. According to his apostolic tradition, there was thanksgiving over oil of thanksgiving, exorcism of oil of exorcism, renunciation of Satan, anointing with oil of exorcism by a presbyter, the affirmation of a creed, baptism in water, then anointing with oil of thanksgiving by a presbyter. Presbyter meaning a priest. Following their baptism, drying themselves and being newly vested, the neophytes were brought into the church. At the end of the rite, the bishop would lay a hand on each of the candidates in prayers. Sponsors spoke on behalf of children who were too young to speak for themselves. Infant candidates were baptized, confirmed, and communicated in one sacramental action with the bishop present, just as adult candidates are initiated into the Christian community. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage a little later, believed in the presence and power of the spirit in baptism, but he felt the spirit was given and received by the power of the laying on of hands. Ambrose of Milan in Spain speaks of a spiritual seal and a perfecting or invocation of the Holy Spirit and its gifts on the neophytes, which takes place after the post-baptismal anointing and foot washing. This Northern Italian practice began the Western theory that confirmation is the completion of baptism. John Chrysostom in Antioch described the rites of having no anointing following baptism. It is in the water that the Holy Spirit descends on the baptized through the words and hands of the priest. Jerome wrote of his distress that presbyters and deacons in churches that are far from the bigger cities have baptized many without the bishop's presence. So here we see just a few examples of the variety of practices being used throughout the Mediter Mediterranean region of the church. In different regions of the church, the newly baptized received a signing with the cross in Milan, Rome, Spain, and North Africa. A laying on of hands in Rome and North Africa. A second anointing by the bishop in Rome. And even in some places, pedalavium or foot washing in Milan and in Spain. Augustine of Hippo believed that Christian preparation should take place through worship, biblical preaching, and reading scripture aloud. Catechumens continued to go through a lengthy period of instruction in the faith. The hand laying and bishop's participation were viewed as a pastoral presence, not to be seen as a completion of the full initiation rite of the water baptism. So the order of society is changing from the early church fathers in the first centuries from then moving on to the time of the popes, with, beginning perhaps with Pope Gregory the Great. In the early church, the question was, what is a Christian? How do Christians live in a pagan world? So baptism was the process that turned a pagan into a Christian. That moved into 
how should a Christian live, behave, and be a good Christian? For it was then a Christian universe, and Christianity was associated with the state. It is that time the church was also having many councils to determine doctrine and belief and creeds. The Council of Rees and the Council of Orange, Cron Fermier or Perficier, are used in reference to particular rites associated with the ministry of bishops in baptismal preparation. That involved the imposition of hands with prayer for the Holy Spirit. Pope Innocent I reinterpreted the Missa, this sacramental part of a service, as to be a ceremonial gesture of signation on the forehead of the neophytes. Faustus of Reeds was a semi-Pelagian bishop in southern Gaul. He gave a Pentecost sermon around the year 450 that impacted future understandings of baptisms. He said, in baptism we are washed, after baptism, we are strengthened. And although the benefits of rebirth suffice immediately for those about to die, nevertheless, the helps of confirmation are necessary for those who will prevail. Rebirth in itself immediately saves those needing to be received in the peace of this blessed age. But confirmation arms and supplies those needing to be preserved for the struggles and battles of this world. Confirmation should be deferred until a suitable maturity had been attained. And there we enter what would be called the age of conversion. During the time of Charlemagne, the power of the clergy and their role in, was about salvation in society. That was an important piece of being a Christian. Moral and educational aspects continued through the works of bishops, cathedrals, monasteries, and parish churches. The church was becoming a missionary church. Missionaries were trained in monasteries that had schools and libraries. Monasteries had rules of life, which became yardsticks of Christian living. And then this outside of the monastery began to be influenced in parishes, which was where most of the laity worshipped. Alcuin in Gaul stated that the chalice completed the eating of the consecrated bread, or the bread and cup confirmed the, part the participants. So the word confirm was used for a variety of things since people received the Eucharist right after being baptized, perhaps that was what confirmed the baptism. Different understanding. From the sixth to the ninth century, the Romanizing and sacramentalizing of Hispano-Gallican practices of Episcopal disciplinary oversight of baptism became known as confirmation of neophytes and bishops had that oversight, that Episcopal oversight. We see in a Galassian sacramentary that baptism took place at the Easter Vigil. After the water blessing, those to be baptized were asked to profess their faith in the Trinity. Godparents answered for infants. The presbyter, priest, baptized each person three times by immersion as the questions were answered. They were then anointed. If the bishop was present, he imposed hands, prayed the sevenfold gift of the spirit, and anointed the newly baptized. All then shared in the Eucharist. Rubenus Morris, who was Bishop of Mainz, was the abbot of a monastery in Fulda with a large network of parish churches, which is where we get our parochial structure. 
He stated, Episcopal chrismation and the laying on of hands brings the grace of the spirit into the baptized with all the fullness of sanctity, power, and knowledge. His rite also contained a rite of confirmation to be celebrated at a later time, not at the baptism. So the length of time between the two parts of initiation, baptism and confirmation, began to grow longer. Suedo Isidore was a compiler of what we call the false decretals. He took part of Faust's sermon and attributed them to Melchiades and Urban I, popes who lived and died during church persecutions in the early fourth century. Hence the importance of being strengthened for, for the faith, strengthened going into battle. From the eighth to the 12th century, the rite of initiation consisted of baptism, confirmation, and first communion, receiving for communion for the first time, being three parts of one whole, but they were not always experienced at the same moment. With each new additional rite, or each additional rite, they weren't new, adding strength to the individual. And by the 11th century, in many areas, infants ceased to receive communion. They were baptized, but then there was this long time span afterwards. The age of seven became a standard as the age of discretion. So that was the time when they received laying on of hands as confirmation. In 1215, the Fourth Lateral Council was hold, held under Pope Innocent III. It was here that the age at which one was obliged to receive communion once a year was defined as the years of discretion. So many discontinued the custom of infant communion almost immediately, even though the council had not forbidden it. Again, that separation of infants from communion. It was close to this time that there was great schism in the church. The controversy continued from the ninth century between orthodoxy and Rome. East and West differed on the procession of the Trinity, where the Holy Spirit came from. The East did not recognize the primacy of the Pope. Lesser issues were about rules of fasting, using unleavened bread at the Eucharist, the celibacy of clergy, divorce, and the manner of conferring confirmation. Then we have the time of Thomas Aquinas and all of the writings that he has given us. Reconciliation, reconciliation between Catholic belief and the new learning of theologians, scholars during this time of scholasticism was largely the work of two Dominican thinkers, one being Thomas Aquinas. His Summa Theologica states that confirmation is a, quote, sacrament of maturity, unquote, bringing an increase of grace for a different phase of life. It involved Christian discipleship, allowing the presence given at baptism to become more effective. The increase of grace gave strength to live and fight the battles of the Christian life or spiritual warfare. The kiss of peace at the end of the ceremony was replaced with a slap on the cheek, a Roman practice closely associated with the medieval guild practice used in commissioning and sending forth journeymen. With Summa Theologica 3, 3a, there emerged a distinct rite separate from baptism as a sacrament of the Holy Spirit for an increase of grace, strength to live and fight the battles of the Christian life, a sacrament of maturity. This reflects a synthesis of the Roman Episcopal post-baptismal rite of hand laying with prayer and anointing and the Spanish Gallican practice of Episcopal oversight 
and supervision of baptism called confirmation. In 1280, the Council of Cologne declared that children under seven were too young to be confirmed because one should learn the rudiments of faith and preparation. And perhaps those who were under seven couldn't do that. So those rudiments included the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ave Maria. Confirmation was being changed from being a sacrament of initiation to one with catechetical dimensions associated with an appropriate age. John Peckham, Archbishop of Canterbury, endorsed a 1282 canon that required confirmation be the requisite prerequisite to receiving com communion. His aim was to rescue confirmation from damnable negligence because bishops were not visiting parishes for confirmation. It had the opposite effect. Another council, this time in Florence in 1439. The decree for the Armenians officially stated that in confirmation, Christians grow in grace and are strengthened in faith. The quote unquote age of discretion was the key to a child's admittance to communion. And then came the Reformation. The Protestant Reformation returned to the understanding that baptism was complete and of itself. There was new birth in water and the Holy Spirit. The seal of grace at baptism is the pouring out of grace of the Holy Spirit. Almost all Protestant denominations continue to use a catechism, which became that official and common vehicle of instruction to prepare candidates. Lutherans, Reformed, Anglicans, and Roman Catholics after, after Trent all used catechisms. And the 1549 Book of Common Prayer had a catechism in it. However, they each retained the sacramental rite of confirmation separated from baptism. In the Church of England during the Reformation, there developed a clear and definite process of Christian initiation. Baptism was a rite of infancy, followed by catechism and confirmation, normally at 14 to 16 years of age, followed by First Communion. Admission to communion was seen as the response to a communicant making a public profession of faith, not an integral part of the sacramental initiation. Water baptism was the full initiation, while confirmation was a pastoral rite. Baptismal vows were reaffirmed by those who had been baptized in infancy, with candidates taking on full responsibility of church membership as they received the laying on of hands from the chief pastor, the bishop, with a prayer for strengthening by the Holy Spirit for their new responsibilities. In 1540, our Book of Common Prayer stated that confirmation was a rite reserved exclusively to the bishop. The theological emphasis was on the gift of the Holy Spirit for strength and constancy. The Holy Spirit was given in baptism. Confirmation was a catechetical process signifying the coming of age in the life of faith. Fifteen forty nine brought another revised Book of Common Prayer. In this, in the baptismal rite here, the anointing with oil was omitted for the first time since apostolic times. And the final rubric states, "And there shall be none be admitted to the Holy Communion until such time as he be confirmed." Confirmation was meant to provide children who had come to years of discretion regarded as around 10 to 12 years of age at that time, with a ritual occasion in which they might ratify the promise of baptism with their own mouth and with their own consent, openly before the church. Anointing had been replaced by the laying on of hands, a gesture from the New Testament to mean bonding 
blessing, commissioning, and healing. This became the outward and visible sign of the bishop's ministry of confirmation. And also, the 1549 BCP included a catechism for instruction. Yet again, there was a revision in 1552 of the Book of Common Prayer. The prayer, send down, changed to strengthen, said by the bishop. And an additional non-sacramental prayer was said for spiritual growth. Defend, O Lord, this child with thy heavenly grace, that he may daily increase in the Holy Spirit. This strengthening appears to assume that the Holy Spirit has been given at baptism and its presence is called upon for new vitality. A dismissal is pronounced with a prayer that mentions the bishop as the successor of the apostles to their ability to communicate the Holy Spirit. More meaning was added in, the, in this particular BCP. More meaning of confirmation to an increase of grace. Also the power to preach to others, a spiritual maturity, and a strength for battle in the Christian life. Its delay after baptism saw confirmation as the ratification by an adult to the baptismal promises that were made on one's behalf when one was an infant. Now let's move across the pond. The Episcopal Church in 1784, when it was established in the colonies or the United States, Samuel M. Seabury emphasized the importance of confirmation in his address at the first Connecticut Convention. Canon three was adopted in 1789 that required regular and frequent Episcopal visitations and administration of confirmation. And Canon 11 stated that one of the duties of a minister was to, quote, prepare children and others, unquote, for confirmation. And at the bishop's visitation, the minister was to be ready to present those, quote, unquote, previously instructed for the same. In nearby New York, John Henry Hobart developed the practice of confirming those new to the Episcopal Church and expecting those Episcopalians who had not been confirmed to come for an Episcopal blessing. Hobart had a high view of the church and his view of confirmation was a rite of apostolic origin, divinely ordained as noted, noted in Acts 8 and the writings of Tertullian, Cyprian, Jerome, Luther, and Calvin. He felt it was important for candidates to have a knowledge and meaning of the catechism and an understanding of the plan of salvation. Another note that could be mentioned, especially in New York and other dioceses, as opposed to Connecticut, which was really a Church of England diocese to start with, was that there were many who were not Church of England folks at that time. So they were Protestants, live, and to live in that area, they belonged to a parish. So confirmation emerged as a sign of membership in the, United, in the Episcopal Church, because the United States had a variety of Protestant religions, religious values, historically and geographically. So many Pis Episcopalians might have thought of this passage as describing their own church. The local priest comes and baptizes, and at a later time, the bishop comes, representing the apostolic ministry, who confers the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, which is very much seen as what happens today. In 1928, we have the Book of Common Prayer. The rite of confirmation included the lesson from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Confirmation emerged as a sign of membership in the Episcopal Church. And then our Book of Common Prayer in, 19, in 1928. 
This contained lengthy rubrics regarding the responsibility of parents to bring their child to be baptized. Following baptism with water, the minister made the sign of the cross upon the child's forehead while praying that he shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified and to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil, now being Christ's faithful soldier. Following the service of baptism, offices of instruction were located in the prayer book. These could be used during worship as the rubrics admonish for the clergy to instruct the young in preparation for confirmation. In 1946, Dom Gregory, Dom Gregory Dix published The Theology of Confirmation in Relationship to Baptism. He maintained that confirmation was a rite taken from the New Testament, consisting of a sealing with chrism, the outward sign of the sealing of the Spirit, until the day of redemption. This view insisted that the Spirit was not active in baptism, but in confirmation. The seal of the Spirit is what completed Christian initiation. In 1951, G.W. Lamp published The Seal of the Spirit. He argued that confirmation was a post-apostolic rite for strengthening those baptized in infancy with the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. He insisted that since membership in Christ is given by faith in the sacrament of baptism, baptism mediates the indwelling presence of the spirit that also dwelt with Christ. The blessings of initiation are given at baptism, which is unrepeatable and rooted in the New Testament and early church liturgies. Baptism itself is the seal. He felt that confirmation should be administered as close to baptism as possible with the ratification of baptismal promises of a pastoral value. And Lionel Mitchell, a contemporary of ours, agreed with G.W. Lampy as one of the ones who worked on the rites that we use today. He said, one is sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism, whether it is the seal of consignation or the inward grace of washing. So today we have our 1979 Book of Common Prayer. In it, baptism is regarded as full initiation into the church and all baptized are welcome to receive communion. To make the transition, parishes began holding first communion classes for children and parents. Confirmation continues to be local for congregations in early adolescence when a bishop makes a visitation. Adults are encouraged to reaffirm their baptismal vows or be received into the Episcopal Church. One thing should be noted that before the Book of Common Prayer came out from of 1979, there were some trial rites, and they did not include a liturgy of confirmation. They did include a liturgy of reaffirmation. But in order for the Book of Common Prayer, 1979, as we have it today, was passed by general convention, they needed to enact or reinstall bishops as being the primary leader of confirmation. Today, confirmation is the renewal of the baptismal covenant, not its completion. Confirmations, confirmants affirm their baptismal commitment while God renews the covenant and empowers them with the Holy Spirit to fulfill their baptismal promises and live the baptismal life to which they are committed. The rubrics in our prayer book continue to state that those baptized at an early age are expected when prepared and ready to make a mature public affirmation of their faith and receive the laying on of hands by the bishop. 
While our prayer book continues to have a catechism called An Outline of the Faith in our prayer book, we have the Baptismal Covenant. This could be seen as the curriculum or the pattern to follow, to be used in catechumenal preparation for all of those who come to be confirmed and to be, though, be ready for anyone who wishes to reaffirm their baptismal promises at various times of the church year, at the Easter Vigil, at the day that we remember the baptism of Christ, on the day of Pentecost. And here are a variety of sources that were used in putting this presentation together. 